This lesson deals with an example with ideal diodes. You can find these notes in the course ebook in chapter 9, starting at the bottom of page 3. Given the circuit with two ideal diodes, where here is the anode of 1 and the cathode of 1, and the anode of 2 and the cathode of 2, could you find the current I sub s by guessing the states of the diodes, D1 and D2? And then check your guesses to make sure they're correct. Let me try by taking a wild guess and guess that D1 is off, in other words, an open circuit, and D2 is on, in other words, a short circuit. Now, where's the anode and cathode of 1? It was here and here, and the anode and cathode of 2. Now, if I'm assuming it's an open circuit, I'm going to solve for the voltage from anode to cathode. And if I'm assuming it's a short circuit, I'll solve for the current from anode to cathode. See whether these guesses were correct or not. And if they are, we'll then solve for I sub s. All right, I'll solve for the voltage VD1. And so I'm going to go around the loop and figure out the value. Now the current in this open circuit is zero, so the voltage across this resistor is zero times 4K. Now the way I like to write Kirchhoff's voltage law is to take the unknown and make it a rise in voltage, put that on the left-hand side of the equation, and then record the drops. Here I see a minus zero. You could also write that as plus and minus a minus zero, although it doesn't change it. So that becomes a drop, a drop of 10, and then a rise that can turn into a drop by making this minus 3. So the rise in voltage equals a drop of minus 0, drop of 10, a drop of minus 3. Or just record the first sign that you see. If it's negative, then the drop would be negative, like it was here. And if it's positive, it's just the quantity that's here. That turns out to be 7 volts, but that's not possible because the curve stops at 0 volts. So that's a contradiction. I don't know I just stop here, but let's solve for the current ID2 and see what was contradicted or not. Well, the voltage across this resistor is 3 volts, and the current in the diode is the current in the resistor. So 3 volts divided by 6K is a half a milliamp, or putting that in your notation, that'd be 500 microamps. So this guess is wrong. Well, since the second guess was right and the first was wrong, let's just try changing the first guess to on and try it again. Now, it's important to note here that we did all the algebra correct in our first guess, but the answer is wrong. Now, here's what's a little different with these kinds of circuits that we call nonlinear, and we'll explain more of this later in the course. We're going to assume this is a short, and this is a short. Again, where's the anode and cathode? I've labeled them here, so the current flowing from anode to cathode. Solve for ID1 and solve for ID2. Okay, now the current that's in ID1 is also the current in the resistor here, a 4K. So if I can solve for this voltage, let's divide by 4K. So let's go around the loop again. So the rise in voltage would equal a drop of 10 and a drop of minus 3. By that by 4K, I get 1.75 milliamps, and that is greater than or equal to zero. Now the current in this diode, I can't get directly because there is no equation for current coming out of a voltage source, but I could solve for the current in the 6K resistor, and then use Kirchhoff's current law to solve for the current in the diode. And again, the voltage across this 6K resistor is three volts. By Ohm's law, that would be a half a milliamp. I'll leave it in milliamps here because I'm gonna do a summation. This is how I like to do Kirchhoff's current law. I want to solve for ID2, so that's entering the node. I'll make everything leave the node. Well, of course, this is leaving the node, and this would be leaving the node if it was in the opposite direction. Current in D2 is the current in the 6K, and then minus the current in ID1. This way you can do things in just one line. That turns out to be a minus 1.25 milliamps, and that's a contradiction because current has to be greater than or equal to zero. If they're both on, don't work. Let's try both off. And again, we did all the algebra correctly, but we got the wrong answer. If this is off, it's an open circuit, anode and cathode, plus and minus, anode and cathode, plus and minus. Let's write down everything we know about the circuit. Since the open circuit here is, has zero current, and this has zero current, then this has to be zero current, so the voltage across the 6K is zero plus zero times 6K. Also, the current in the 4K resistor is zero, so the voltage here is zero times 4K. So to solve for VD1, I'll make it a rise in voltage, and then record the drops around the loop. VD1 is equal to minus zero, plus 10, minus 0, and that gives me a plus 10, but that's a contradiction. Again, we could just stop here, but let's, let's do the other one also. I like this, a rise in voltage by going around the loop this way. Rise in voltage is VD2, the drop is 3, the drop is minus 0. That gives me a plus 3 volts. I get a double contradiction. This isn't correct either. There's one last case, let's try that. So the last combination we haven't tried is D1 is on and D2 is off. So the anode and cathode of 1, the current flowing from anode to cathode is our value of ID1, and the voltage across the anode and cathode of diode 2 is VD2. 
Because of the open circuit here, the current that flows in the 4K and the 6K is the same. So I've got an equivalent resistance seen by this 10 volt source of 10K. So I get one milliamp. Is that greater than or equal to zero? Yeah, so that checks. Let's go around the loop this way. Now this one milliamp flowing in here is going to create a voltage of one milliamp times 6K, which is going to be equal to six volts because the Ks and the millis cancel. Let's go around the loop again. The rise in voltage would be VD2. The drop is equal to three volts and then minus the 6K times the one milliamp and I get minus three volts. Is that less than or equal to zero? Yes, so these both check. If this case didn't work, that means you made an algebraic mistake. That the diodes have to be in some region and so we'll eventually find them. And so now that you know that these guesses were correct, we can then solve for whatever we're interested in. A lot of times we'll solve for the current coming out of a battery to calculate how long the battery will last. The current IS is also the current in the diode D1, and that was equal to one milliamp. Now in this example, we had diode D1 and D2 as off on, on on, off off, and on on. There are two possibilities for each diode. The number of total possibilities is actually two to the n. In this case, n was equal to two, so there were four combinations. If you had three diodes, you'd have two to the three, which is eight, and so it snowballs real quickly. So this trial and error guessing can be very tedious, and of course, you may get it on the last guess. So is there any way that we could maybe have a strategy for guessing maybe better on our first shot? Take a look at that next. Let's assume that the diode is a resistor. Now we saw from the plot on page one that it had a slope such that it was zero ohms or infinity. Now zero and infinity are extreme numbers. Let's just think of a low value and a high value, maybe one ohm and maybe 100 million ohms. We're going to analyze the circuit and try to figure out the possible direction of the current in the diode. If the current is flowing from anode to cathode, then we'll assume it's a short. If the current's flowing from cathode to anode, we'll assume it's an open. Let's go back and revisit that last example with that strategy being applied. So again, you've got to identify where is the anode and the cathode and show the current flowing from anode to cathode. I'm going to call this diode a resistor RD1. And here's the anode and the cathode of diode 2. And so the current's going to flow from anode to cathode. Now let's assume that these circuits are practical. What that means is that if I had a battery in a circuit, I probably wouldn't have other batteries because that would be pretty expensive. Typically in a real circuit or an actual circuit or a practical circuit, the voltage that's the biggest is usually the source of power and the other batteries absorb power. We'll learn how to do this a little bit later in the chapter. Now, of course, the resistors can only absorb power. So in this example, current's going to have to come out of the 10 volt source to provide power for the resistors, but also for the other batteries that are smaller than it. So in this particular case, the current would come out of here and it would have to come back and likewise come out of here and come back. The current is flowing from anode to cathode in my guess for diode one, and it's flowing from cathode to anode in diode two. So that would be my first guess. Guess that the first diode is a short and the second diode is an open. And that's shown here. And obviously that was the case that we did on the fourth guess. Now this may not always work to give you the answer on the first guess, but it might get you closer when you do your second guess based on what you found in the first guess. But we'll definitely cut down on going through all two to the end states. But in general, there is no way to find a method that will always work because these circuits are what we call nonlinear. So we had a resistor and we plotted the voltage versus the current. It was a straight line passing through the origin. This device, and some of the ones we're going to take a look at in the course, that's not true. It's linear in pieces, but we're going to have to take a different approach to solving problems. And again, this is called the assumed state approach. Let's take a look at an example of what's called the transition state. In the previous example, we had a voltage source here. I'll call it V sub S. It had a value of 3 volts. And when we had that condition with the 10 volts, the diode D1 was on and D2 was off. Now, what would happen if we began to increase V sub S? At what point would it cause the diode D2 to turn on and almost become a short circuit? Let's see if we can figure that out. So let's assume that diode D1 is still short. We're going to vary V sub S such that this diode is going to start to conduct. Well, let's figure out what it takes to take us to the transition point. In other words, there's no voltage across the diode and no current going through it. So we don't have a symbol for that in our course so far. So we're just going to label it right on the drawing. Now what we've done here is actually specified another result. When we had the open circuit, we had no current. When we had the short circuit, we had no voltage. But now we've got another constraint and either the current or the voltage has been added. So we have to back off on a variable. So whenever you do transition points, you're going to have to unspecify either a voltage source or a resistance and solve for that variable that would take you to the transition point. 
Again, the transition points are covered by the models. It's just simply going to show us when things begin to change. This is really good for calculating when an alarm is going to trip or not trip, and some other applications we'll see in the course. Let's analyze the circuit. Now, the current being zero in here means that the current in the diode is going to continue to flow in the 6K resistor. The rise in voltage is 10. The drop is going to be ID1 times 4K, of course, there's zero here, plus ID1 times 6K. Pull out the 4 and the 6 and get 10. So you have 10 divided by 10K, and that's 1 milliamp, just like it was before. So this checks that this guess was correct. And now lastly, let's solve for the voltage of V sub S. So the rise in voltage would equal the drops around the loop, again, because current is flowing in this direction of 1 milliamp. We have that V sub S is equal to 0 plus 6K times 1 milliamp. The Ks in the milli cancel, and we get 6 volts. So when this voltage source is raised to 6 volts, then both diodes would be on. And these are some examples of ideal diode circuits.